The, the ITV channel, there's a presenter, he talks to the spokesman of Israel and he says that but it didn't all begin on October 7th, did it? And the Israeli spokesman says, I warn you against contextualizing October 7th, a really nasty threat. Basically saying, I will make you lose your job if you try to make this a serious discussion and debate about what actually happened on October 7th. The reason he threatened him so publicly and not in a sophisticated way is because all of their sophistication has been broken by you. All of their ability to have this sophisticated control over the narrative has been broken by you. When I went back to the Yaqeen podcast, because someone made a joke, these Americans, they said he finished his Yaqeen podcast and picked up this very English teacup and he drank his tea. I was like, what teacup are they talking about? So I thought, let me go back and see the video, what teacup they're talking about so I can buy another one. In any case, before the Yaqeen podcast came up, IDF advert. So I thought I need to do Tahara. I need to... So I'm going to listen to Saud al-Sharim, Surah Taha, which is the surah where his melody and his, his recitation when I was 16 years of age is what really got me into the Qur'an when I listened to it. Before I was just praying, you know, like if dad wasn't watching, you just do turbo. <laughs> After that surah, I took my, my prayers very seriously, especially because, you know, when you memorize a big surah as a teenager, there's a bit of prestige to it because all your friends are just reading Qul a'udhu rabbin nas, malik an nas and then you come out and you go Qala fama rabbukuma ya Musa, qala rabbuna alladhi and genuinely you feel, you start going and they're like Sammy, you know you take way too long in prayers now I'm like it's Surah Taha, it's a long Surah <laughs> When I open Su'ud al-Sharim to make Tahara from seeing the IDF advert it's like the IDF wanted to do the Bismillah for me because it popped up before Su'ud al-Sharim for those of you who know social media advertising, for those of you who know social media advertising, you'll know that in order to get an advert on things that are unrelated to the issue, you need to spend a hell of a lot of money. You need to spend a lot of money. Like I remember when I first started Facebook adverts many years when I was trying to start the international interest to make it spread. And I'd be like, I want it to be popular in America, UK, English speaking countries, Malaysia, this place. And I would just watch the reach go like bigger and bigger and bigger. But the price go higher, 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 higher. I said, I can't afford this. And then eventually you can only really afford to spread the message within your area of London. So for them to spend that much money shows that they spent billions in order to restore control over the narrative. Even the channels that brought the Palestinians, they were stunned because this generation of Palestinians are eloquent in English. They're able to present their case and they were able to push back on that. Do you condemn Hamas? Do you condemn Hamas? Do you condemn Hamas? Until now, it's become absolutely irrelevant because everybody now is focused on the genocide. The Israelis are realizing that the ones who are moving the goalposts of the narrative are no longer the Israelis. The ones who are controlling the narrative are no longer the Israelis. The ones who are controlling the narrative are one 1.9 billion Muslims amplifying the voice of the Palestinians, responding to the call to the Palestinians. They are tweeting, they are sharing, they are doing their TikTok, they are breaking the algorithm. They are absolutely, it's so stupendously popular that the Al is penetrating all the bubbles of the algorithm. Another girl says, you know what, I want to understand because I've been seeing videos of Palestinians that have been amplified by the Ummah of 1.9 billion that broke the algorithm and broke the bubbles of the TikTok algorithms, which means that the Palestinian content reached every single single handheld phone in the world. She says, I want to understand, I've been watching these videos of Palestinians, they're being bombed and killed, but they keep saying, Hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil. They keep saying, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. They keep saying, everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we will continue to struggle and we will continue to resist. I want to know where they get their resilience from. And they keep quoting these passages from the Quran. So I'm going to oh, use my TikTok, and we're going to go through pages of the Quran together. You, my audience, every day we're going to do so. One week later, she says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. And I saw her with Haifa Yunus at one of the conventions. People looking and looking at Gaza, and while our hearts weep and our hearts are breaking, and while some of us, in the, the audacity of some of us to call the Palestinians weak, when the world is so taken by their strength, so taken by their resilience, that the number of people entering Islam just over the past three months is phenomenal because they don't see weakness in the Palestinians. They see absolute strength and resilience and they say, I want to be like those Palestinians. I want to learn the resilience of these Palestinians. And they are the conclusion that they are coming to, subhanAllah, the conclusion they are coming to. Why do they open the Quran? Because they, the conclusion they come to is this resilience 
is not a genetic thing. This resilience is a Quranic Islamic thing. And that's why they enter Islam because they are searching for the resilience that the Palestinians have, that they have concluded can only come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What a blessed people. May Allah accept the shuhada.